Bene, ci sei Daniele? Daniele in questa sede è importante solamente per quello che da tre anni fa con noi nel gruppo di ricerca, lui e Ada Chiara sono i nostri due preziosissimi consulenti e molte delle cose che avete sentito sono frutto delle idee che, eh, che hanno disseminato nel nostro gruppo da, da un po' di tempo. Ho provato a, a fare una lista di controllo mentale ehm, per, per capire se eh, le parole che usiamo, ehm, le idee che abbiamo elaborato in questi anni sono condivise. E eh, lo faccio partendo da, dal dato che esiste un fatto. Eh, e passando tra il memoriale e il patrimoniale eh, e considerando questo elemento come un elemento di patrimonio culturale, di eredità, c'è un, un fatto, un insieme di fatti che sono riconosciuti come meritevoli di essere conservati e trasmessi. Um. Then the fact, well, we'll see what the fact will be, but I believe that um, Guido's speech actually gave us a, a real interpretation of the facts. There is an element which I believe is fundamental, that is when So it's uh, 70 years since these uh, events took place and uh, their um, uh, presence in our memories uh, has come back about 20 years ago. So this very late uh, recognition of the facts that happened is extremely important for this project because it's, it is not the same story as for many other um, museums. Uh, this is to say something that uh, begins from a, a very lively memory and needs to be preserved or maintained by the protagonists, the actors, uh, in order to become part of their history. Here, this, the process is completely the opposite, in a way. The third question is, uh, who is going to do this? Well, we've been thinking a lot about uh, a fundamental document for us, which is the Faro Convention, signed in 2005. The Faro Convention, after the Mostar events, aims at examining the common cultural heritage of Europe Uh, a heritage that is uh, well often linked with physical objects and a common element of this uh, heritage is uh, the uh, democracy and uh, the rights of people so the values these are values these are not objects so they're not places and they are part of our cultural heritage we can call them what we want but we are a community of historians And uh, if we can share this idea that the cultural heritage is a something that um, is common to everyone, well, the problem, the idea of cultural heritage expressed by the Faro Convention, which uh, gives people the right and the duty to define what needs to be preserved, which means that nations do no longer have this authority. Populations do. And people are defined in a new way, so to speak. That is to say, the so-called heritage community. A heritage community is a community that has common values and, uh, well, common traditions and common knowledge, common uh, goods. And um, 
It has a duty to act in front of the public, in front of the world, to define what uh, has to be uh, defined as heritage. So what is a heritage community? Is that a local community? I think that it is a heterogeneous community, a complex one, a local one, but also we're talking about a national one, but also an international one. So we really have to think about a hybrid community and considering certain facts that are considered as interesting enough to be preserved and transmitted. So a community really takes up the responsibility to trigger a process to preserve them and pass them on to future generations. And uh, moreover, we know that uh, cultural heritage is made of resources that are useful for the future. So cultural heritage is seen as a resource and it gets a meaning according to its usefulness. So there may be some economic usefulness, but actually its usefulness is uh, more abstract. So it's something that it is important and necessary for the future. So this is very important because there is no memorial duty. There's a right to memory and there's a duty to the extent, I mean, uh, of considering that memory as a good for the future, as something for the future to be preserved. So the very first uh, sort of uh, mission is about uh, considering which are the values that are considered as worth being remembered and transmitted and conveyed to future generations as a resource for the future. Well, the past uh, is interesting and important but not that important if there is no potential related to the future so these are the very first four four issues on which i think it is worth discussing and i think these are the four pillars we should build our future project these are the four key take-home messages and how so, something that happened in the past, a set of events or a specific fact, a specific episode. So, an event, according to physics, usually is defined by three elements. But again, we can use the definition we want. So, once that said, we can decide to make up uh, a memorial monument for something. So once these four conditions are all fulfilled, these four prerequisites, and very often we have been uh, told uh, what are monuments. You can have, uh, I mean, um, excessive monuments or you say hyper monuments or hyper monuments, but still this is about setting up a monument and Guido finished his speech on museums saying that museums are justified where there are mobile or immobile things that are worth being displayed. And so the traditional museum mode is about uh, using objects, artifacts, finds, mobile objects to transmit a certain perception and vision of things. And of course, any object is a meaning carrier. So again, this is something that is a given, this is a fact. But here we have, we didn't have any objects, we have a place. So we may have a diffuse museum. Well, if we had places that were worth being preserved, but actually the places we have seen that Faust and Guido showed us actually 
are not particularly beautiful or do not have a, a highly valuable monumental value and so well they are not worth being preserved so by watching the places the size actually you don't get any meaning so again so their existence or non-existence i mean no specific value transmission occurs so and then you have a, a memorial site which is something else a memorial site is a place with a specific meaning because it staged events so that could be turned into a memorial but this is not the case and according to what was said before well the ideal memorial site in this case would be uh, uh, Villa Emma but uh, Villa Emma was not is not available so we need to be content enough with uh, Prato Galli so memorial sites well as they are defined here it is here is the definition is a meaningful unit that was made a symbol of some communities to stop time, block the work of oblivion, trying to make uh, death immortal, and going through so some meanings and convey them in a bunch of signs. So this is exactly what we would like to do, and we are talking about something that is going to be opposite Villa Emma. So opposite Villa Emma. And this seems to be the key sort of aspect of the project. But then there are other ways through which somebody's memory can be celebrated, commemorated or objectified. You have an entity that can be active in the present and that works to pay homage or to celebrate the memory. So scholarships and grants are a typical example of that. Or there may be activities that somehow sort of um, make the past present. These are so-called useful monuments. And for belonging reasons, I'm thinking about uh, a specific uh, monument uh, set up in 1919, 1920, uh, Convito Valdese, so a facility where young people can be hosted and so can have access to educational uh, facilities or you can have a, a memorial uh, for reconciliation so there can be several solution so when you recover the past and turn it into something that is useful for the present well why not we may consider that and i think that yesterday we heard that considering previous facts and previous event well I think that here welcome and reception are very important and we have been talking about refuge, hideaway, hiding place, but certainly we can consider this idea of reception as the key uh, topic. And then there is also the idea of an interpretation center. Well, I don't think that we should write uh, interpretation center on a plate, uh, but certainly these uh, designates and defines uh, a certain kind of facility of institute and before showing you this, That could be a variable of a museum. So is a place that uh, 
enhances a topic. So the saved Jewish youngsters within a specific context, Villa Emma and Nonantola. So is about rescuing these Jewish youngsters within the Nonantola context. Well, when it comes to interpretation issues, well, usually we try to understand how the past can be used to better understand the present. And we have a long tradition that comes from Freeman Tilden, who said in 1957, interpretation is an education activity. Educational doesn't mean uh, instructive, uh, pe pedagogic. It means that uh, it is about the development of people's skills. It, this is the empowerment of people, the humanization and socialization in museology. So how I can make something, how can I make a human being more human and uh, help these human beings socialize? So this is about unveiling, so revealing the meaning of things and their relations through the use of original object. And we're talking about American parks. So the personal experience and uh, so you can also use examples instead of the simple transmission of uh, objective information. So I think that this is a very nice uh, interpretation uh, definition that uh, we can use as a starting point. And here, let's see the six key issues, the six principles of Friedman Tillman. First of all, Every interpretation of a landscape, of an exhibition, of a tale that doesn't have recourse in some way or another to a trait of the personality of the experience of the visitor is sterile. Second principle, information, pure information, new information is not interpretation. So this is a sort of disclosure based on information. Third principle, interpretation is an art that combines many others, uh, regardless of the raw material being scientific or architectural. Any art can be taught more or less in some ways. And so uh, this is about uh, the personal direct mediation, but this can also be applied to places. Then interpretation tries to make people think instead of uh, teaching things to people. And I think that Guido expressed that very clearly. So provoking thoughts and not instructing thoughts. Uh, so thought provoking instead of uh, uh, message imposing. So thought provoking means uh, generating a reaction in a person, in the recipient. And then the interpretation that should try to present a whole and not just a part. So this is another key element. And uh, I do not absolutely uh, share what uh, has been said by Mr. Cavallon about his um, definition of metonymia, because here we are talking about uh, the fragmentation of a segment and revisionism is specifically based on the extraction of a part from a whole just to change its meaning and to turn it opposite, opposite, uh, upside down. So we really need to keep this unity of the whole because if you really want to know the facts, you also need to know what was there before, not only in Nantola, but in the whole region, in Italy, in the European context. You need to be able to set those events into a context. So really, this is about uh, placing things into a context. Uh, and uh, because things happen in a time, in a space, in a specific space, uh, spatial and temporal setting and framework. So you need to know that. That's why you need to keep this unity principle and to comply with it. And then the interpretation for children should not be a mitigated version of uh, the reality. And I think that there is no intellectual communication uh, versus emotional communication. You can work on the emotions because you work on the whole individuals. So that's why, I mean, you, there is no separation between the two because you involve the, all the senses of a person when you communicate with them. 
Well, I think there are three main options. You can contemplate things. Well, this is the wonder mechanism. So, I see something, regardless of me, knowing or not knowing the thing, I just stop and stare because I'm amazed. So, this is the observation or the resonance. So, I observe something in a frontal position. And this is another uh, opportunity. So, I'm sort of uh, more analyze oriented. And then there is uh, the immersion, inclusive situation, and uh, my relation to the things surrounding me or the relation I have with the tool triggered by somebody puts me at the center of stage, so to speak. So I am the protagonist. This is the immersive, inclusive model. But somehow, in all three contexts, you have the emotions. And then, according to Tillman, again, I mean, interpretation should be the same for everybody. So, having a children versions of things is something that is appalling. This is something to be avoided. And interpretation is very well defined also by George Steiner when he says that uh, there can be no decoding without communication. Every time we communicate something, we are decoding something. So any kind of interpretation implies a decodification. It's like a translator. It's uh, a translator of uh, languages, cultures. So this is a mediator. And so again, it's an executor. So it's somebody that somehow sort of translates some material into something else. And well, the glossary is over. Well, now I would like to share with you three remarks one on the institute, one on the space, and one in the center. I think that Villa Emma Foundation is the institute. So This is something that uh, is needed and that also deals with research. And uh, this is also a conservation institute. So academies, universities, cultural institutes do the same. Well, as to the event and the topic, the context. So this means that this institute should have a library, archives, a media library. So a part of the space is devoted to these functions. But this is also communication institute. Conservation and communication are two key roles played by museums. We have the PRC model, Preservation, Research, Communication, and CC, Curation and Communication and Conservation. So, we are within the context that the French museology defines as museum. So this is not just about the traditional museum, but this is also a specific relation between man and reality. So we are within the museum context, but within a structure that doesn't preserve objective, uh, sort of concrete objects like uh, exhibits or finds, but it keeps immaterial, intangible things, memory, stories, Tales, narratives, values. Mm. 
And this is done through a specific medium, through a specific tool, which is space. So this means that the text is literally traveled through by the visitor. So meaning construction happens and occurs thanks to these movement and journey into the space. So this is something that is uh, about an experience. So it's different from a film, it's different from a play, it's different from uh, another kind of experience. A medium of this kind is uh, a functioning, well-working medium. So this has to do with several factors. So this can generate wonder, shame, pride, Once you structure this message, this value, then you can restructure that into few communication units so that it can be absorbed by any visitor in a bearable amount of time. Because, of course, I mean, meaning perception is something that uh, happens, I mean, uh, over time, it's a movement in space and time that implies a physical and mental effort. So you should try to reduce messages to the minimum, the bare needed minimum. That means that within the structure, being that thematic or chronologic, you need to identify very easy units. Each of them has a meaning, each of them should have a... So, you have a content and a title, and it should be associated to values. So, these are key topic. And there are some criteria we may consider. So, the monument, the site, and the architectural project will take care of the hull, of the cocoon, of the skin of something. But then you have the contact. So, there are two ways to set up museums today, and one is prevailing. Sometimes, museum architects set up a, a, hell, a, a sort of a hull, a cocoon, that has no relation to the content inside, then you can work around a project in a more targeted way. So it depends. So Mendini designed a museum with uh, cross walls and uh, tilted walls, and that posed uh, huge problems for the hanging of works. And then you have Bilbao, that is extreme. But sometimes, when you have no relation between the two, well, that may pose problems. And then you have the huge dishes museum, which is something different, unique. That's a monument. And this is a monument you can visit from the inside. And again, you need to design a space that needs to be convenient, visible, including offices, that includes labs, that includes spaces, that includes uh, several sorts of areas for several functions and purposes. And I think uh, that uh, this was the main uh, principle behind the creation of museums. And uh, I would like to say something about the word uh, education. And we talk about mediation because sometimes education seems to be lacking something as if it was uh, flawed with uh, shortages and shortcomings. 
I think that the word mediator in this case is more suitable because that means starting from uh, certain knowledge, certain memories, recollections, and lived experiences, and try to convey them as uh, mediators, as uh, carriers of that information, and uh, sort of trying to hand all that on to a recipient. And the final user, the final recipient is the audience, is the public. And when it comes to a museum project, uh, so, of course, uh, this is going to be hinged uh, on some context that need to be expressed and disseminated. But most of all, the most important element in a museum is the public. As, as uh, Georges Bataille used to say, the audience is uh, very important. But also Vialat says, another French thinker, says that uh, museums should be in the hats and minds of visitors. And Florence Pizzoni tells us, I thought uh, uh, that uh, museums were places of memory. But after we occur, uh, I know that uh, people are places of memory, people's minds. Uh, 